are in listen only mode. Hi, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philip. Most of you know me from um, LinkedIn and the messages I've been sharing with you in the past uh, few weeks, uh, also um, over, um, over email. Um, of course, today we have um, our free webinar on flexible uh, budgets and variances with um, our expert uh, trainer, uh, Pierre Hilal. And uh, this is one of the topics that's um, um, covered also in the CMA, the Certified Management um, Accountant um, Program and Designation, and will assist uh, most of the participants as well as the ones that are interested to, of course, take this um, examination. Um, this webinar will be around uh, one, uh, one and a half, uh, two hours. That's the maximum time we have allocated today. And also there will be a questions and answers section at the end of the webinar. So feel free to pose your questions on the um, dashboard uh, where the Q&A section is. Uh, please make it uh, as specific as possible, concise, so our expert trainer can, of course, allocate and address them um, one by one. We're not going to have all the time to, um, of course, answer each and every question. So. Um, uh, we are very limited with time, so we'll try to go as many as, as possible. Um, I would like to mention that this session is recorded, so you will be all getting the um, actual video recording uh, at, uh, at the end of the webinar. So uh, this will be distributed uh, maybe in the next couple of days from our side. Um, and um, even our expert trainer will have a, a file that will be shared additionally with you. Um, in addition, I would like to point out that um, by attending this webinar, um, of course, fully, at the end, you will also get a certificate of attendance. And, um, of course, this will be distributed uh, of uh, electronic way on your, on, your, uh, on your email. So um, I will leave the floor now to Mr. Pierre. He will, of course, start the actual webinar. And I wish everyone, of course, a great and productive time and uh, definitely will be, will be staying in touch. Uh, Pierre, I'll leave the floor up to you now, of course, and you can um, start your, your presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Philip. And uh, hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, my name is Pierre Halal. I teach uh, accounting at Concordia University here in Montreal, Canada. And I prepared a presentation for you all today, um, something that I think and hope will be beneficial to you all writing the, uh, the uh, CMA uh, entrance exams, okay? Um, now, what I'm not going to do throughout today's presentation, I'm sure you'll agree it will be a long and boring one if I do, is I'm not going to read every single, every single part of the presentation, um, as I think that would make for a long and uh, boring presentation. So... Uh, we don't want that, okay? Um, There's several topics in this document that we're gonna go through, um, and they range in difficulty from very, um, from very easy to somewhat difficult. Now, what I wanna lead up to eventually is a calculation of, um, the pre preparation, excuse me, of flexible budgets and master budgets, and ultimately the calculation of variances. Now, I chose this topic because I teach managerial accounting at Concordia, and variances in particular um, always seem to give students a hard time, at least in, in my experience. So hopefully after this presentation, you're all going to walk away. Um, you're, you're all, you're all going to walk away um, having something that you can take with you and, you know, a useful study tool. Okay, um, okay so we're going to continue on. Uh, I'm going to basically scroll down uh, through this presentation to start. And um, as Philip had mentioned, uh, this is a uh, PDF document that I put together myself. Um, I will be emailing it to Philip later on. He'll also be making it available um, to you. So again, hopefully it'll be a useful study tool. Okay. Now, um, okay, so for those of you following along, okay, um, so I'm going to start with some very basic theory, okay? Um, 
budgeting, as you guys might all already know, a budget's essentially a plan for the future. Okay. Um, some of the benefits of budgeting include what? Planning. It's basically a financial plan. Controlling. Resource allocation. Who gets how much money for what? And also feedback. Once you compare, um, once you compare actual results to to budgeted results. Okay. Now, um, okay. effective budgeting. Okay. Some of the some of the principles of effective budgeting include what? Um, Buy-in and support from top management. And without that, there could be some very uh, adverse effects on employee morale. Um, coordination at all levels of the organization. Um, coordination and input from all levels of the organization. And as well, um, meaningful, meaningful incentives. Okay, uh, some of the problems encountered. Um, now, to my knowledge, uh, to my knowledge, questions like this haven't really come up on the CMA exam, but this is sort of a back, this is background information that really leads into the main, the main part of our presentation. All right. So uh, some of the problems encountered, and maybe some of you have experienced this in your own, um, in your own line of work or in your own firms. Um, disputes over scarce company resources, a lack of funds. Um, um, lack of coordination between departments, not speaking to each other, um, assigning responsibility, and so on and so on. Um, now, budgetary slack as well as always. Uh, budgetary slack, what does that mean? Um, oftentimes, just before the end of a budget year, uh, some surplus funds may be available and uh, managers may be inclined to go out and spend those funds for fear that they'll lose them the following year um, if they if they don't um, if they don't spend the money okay so the idea is that basically with coordination at all levels throughout all levels of the organization um, some of these problems could uh, could at least be minimized okay now um, as i was saying this is just some basic theory here leading into our um, leading into our basic presentation um, pro forma statements. Basically, I like to think of pro forma statements are as sort of what if statements, if you will. For example, if you were planning a large capital expenditure and you wanted to know what the effects would be on your financial statements and on your balance sheet, um, you would prepare statements around those. On the balance sheet, you would show the effects, um, the effects of the asset purchase, the effects possibly on your cash. And maybe any any financial ratios as well. Okay, um, and you would do the same uh, for the income statement or the statement of comprehensive income as well. So if you're trying to map out the effects of trying to map out the effects of a possible purchase or project, uh, you would prepare pro forma statements. Okay. Now, um, difference between a budget. A difference between a budget and a forecast. Okay. Now, um, usually a budget is prepared at the start of the year. Okay. It's usually cast in stone initially. Okay. Now, um, what happens is forecasts basically, uh, that typically what happens is actual results never perfectly match the budgeted results. So new information becomes available, and using actual results, we prepare often what we call a rolling forecast which hopefully will give a better picture of where the results of an organization um, are headed. Okay. Now, um, so um, if we look at some of the differences between a budget and a forecast here, A letters A to E. Okay. So the budget is a detailed presentation of the future results, financial position, and cash flows. Okay. A budget, I mean, most companies have um, have a budget season, which typically extends anywhere from two to three months in most, most companies. Um, budgets, budgets are only updated once a year. Um, now, and letter C is particularly important. When we compare actual results to something for the purposes of calculating variances, we compare our actual results usually to those in the budget because forecasts are subject to change all the time. So it's not customary to prepare um, to prepare a variance analysis comparing actual results to those in the forecast. 
Okay. So um, forecasts are a meaningful, well, I'm not going to say real time, but they're, they're sort of a meaningful tool that actually allows management to take action during the year rather than having to wait, wait out the whole year and see what your actual results come in, um, come in at for the whole year. Okay. So that allows management to correct, and basically allocate and reallocate resources um, as needed. Now, um, okay, now forecasts, um, forecasts are typically limited to major revenue and expense items. Um, I'm sure many of you deal with forecasts in your own entities. We, we update them at regular intervals, typically monthly, um, quarterly. Sometimes even more often than that, if you have dash, a dashboard software in your organizations, this must often, uh, some dashboards uh, will actually allow updated forecasts in real time. Okay. And as I mentioned, um, no variance analysis uh, comparing the forecast to the actual results. Okay. Now, okay, the key difference between a budget and a forecast here, uh, right at the bottom, is that a budget is a plan where a business wants to go, and a forecast is indicating where we're actually going. Okay. So um, let's continue on here. Okay. Now, uh, projection is an anticipated uh, future financial results based on the most accurate, most recent avail um, available information. So um, say you have your forecast, you're halfway through the year. Um, and the thing is your forecasted results differ from your year-to-date budget figures, and you're trying to project your year-end results, well, your forecasts are usually based on newer information and are, are in all likelihood more relevant. So those forecasts are basically the trend, and basically those will be used to predict what the results will show up at by the end of the year, okay? Assume with all the information that we're aware of. Okay, now I'm gonna to choose to skip through this next section of called activity-based budgeting because to my knowledge and in my experience, it's not altogether super important for the CMA exam. But the rest of the material in this document is. Now, just a reminder, you can always go back and replay. Uh, you can always go back and replay um, parts of this document, um, and once again, this PDF will be made available to you uh, after the presentation. Okay. Now, um, on page six of my document, um, zero-based budgeting. Okay, this is something I feel that CMA candidates should be aware of. Okay. Zero-based budgeting, you're basically justifying expenses as though they, they were occurring for the first time. And that's what we mean by a zero-based. Okay, so zero-based budgeting is a method of justified and approved for each new period. So, for example, if year after year after year you have um, uh, travel allowance of so much given to each every employee, um, using zero-based budgeting, that travel allowance would be scrutinized and would need to be justified year after year after year, okay, um, regardless of how much previous money has been given. Now, uh, what are some advantages and disadvantages of zero-based budgeting? Okay. Um, accuracy helps companies look over every department to make sure they're getting the correct amount of money. Um, efficiency, reduction in wasteful spending, coordination, and communication. So, in other words, zero-based budgeting looks at every single budgeted amount and puts it under the microscope, if you will, and just we'll try to determine whether or not we really need um, those allocated funds. Okay. Now, some of the disadvantages quite quickly here, um, a bureaucracy, the paperwork to track all of these, um, to track all of these um, uh, budgeted amounts. Um, corruption in using zero-based budgeting managers can tend to skew numbers to make, to turn expenditures into vital activities. Okay, thus creating a need for them. 
Okay, and the end result here is basically wasted company funds. Okay, uh, what else? Um, intangible justifications. Okay, I think we skip this this little part right here. Managerial time. Okay, um, again, pretty obvious. This comes at the expense of train of the extra training for managers. Okay, now. Um, on page seven, I have a right of participant explanation here of participating budgeting, participative budgeting, which you can um, go and read on your own once you get your PDF document. But I'll summarize it for you uh, quite quickly. It's just essentially when uh, all levels of the organization participate and have and have input into the budgeting process. Okay. So, um, I mean, some of, the, the, um, so some of the things that make up a good participative budgeting process are incentives, open lines of communication, and, and so on, okay? The opposite to participative budgeting is top-down budgeting. Top-down budgeting means budgeted amounts are just basically imposed from the upper levels of the organization. Priority-based budgeting, once again, okay, this is something I'd urge you to read on your own time, but priority-based budgeting, priority -based budgeting is pretty much what it sounds like. Um, the company will have limited, uh, limited resources, limited funds, and the higher priority cases or projects, if you will, get allocated the funds first, and until we run out of money, and basically, uh, we go down our list of priorities, and if there's anything, any funds left over for our lower priority projects, um, those get allocated accordingly. Okay. Um, now, benchmarking. Um, typically, when a company benchmarks, what we do here, um, benchmarking, you're just typically comparing against best practices or um, practices in an industry uh, in a segment or basically within your own firm you can benchmark internally as well as externally um, now with respect to the CMA exams um, some of the questions obviously will be quantitative in nature okay some of them will be quantitative in nature um, others will just be will test short-term memory just theory for example, zero-based budgeting is A, B, C, D. Um, which one of the following is an example of benchmarking? And much as you don't want to memorize these concepts, you want to be aware of them at least superficially as to what they are. Because um, in my experience, candidates tend to worry a lot about um, calculating numbers. And that is a very important part of the CMA exam. But, um, don't discount the importance of understanding some basic theory. Um, and um, okay, on page 10, now we're going to get into the budgeting process. And um, okay, I'm going to keep the theory to a minimum. We're actually going to be calculating some numbers. If you look behind me over here, I have a whiteboard set up. And I will likely end up using a whiteboard with some markers um, to calculate certain key numbers. Okay. Now, ultimately, from here onward, okay, this is the uh, the most important part of the presentation. So I hope you'll uh, I hope you'll follow along with me. Okay, uh, we're going to start the rather big picture here. Okay, master budget. Okay, basically, master budget, also known as a static budget. So what happens during budgeting season? Okay, suppose your company sells a single product. Now, our assumptions here are that we are um, we are a manufacturing company. I realize that may not apply to all of you, but this is what our example is built around. So we're a manufacturing company. We'll have direct materials, labor, overhead, inventories, ultimately, and we're, we're going to go from there. Okay. Now, this page gives you an overall view of the budgeting process. Okay. Now, typically, we're going to assume a one-year timeline. Okay. The first thing, letter A, the first budget is the operating budget. Okay. And ultimately, letter A, sales drives everything. Sales based on the 
based on anticipated demand, um, et cetera, et cetera. From there, um, we prepare a production budget. Okay, so this includes sub budgets, if you like, for direct materials, labor, and overhead. Now, in our production budget, we may take account ending inventory and beginning inventory requirements as well. We may want to, we may want to some some inventory some uh, businesses are seasonal, so we may want to um, we may want to manufacture more than enough uh, to cover our sales. Um, also, economies of scale develop as well when you produce more. Now, that's that's a trade-off. If you produce more, uh, you might get a lower dollar cost per unit, but at the same time, you might end up with um, a large amount of obsolete inventory at the end of the period. So um, that has their trade off there that have to be balanced. So start with our sales and we have our production budget. Then from there, selling and administration budget, and then our cost of goods manufactured and sold budgets. Okay. And ultimately the operating cash budget. Now, it's important to be aware of the overall budgeting process, but personally, I don't see candidates having to prepare an entire operating budget on the CMA entrance on the CMA exams. Excuse me, um, but um, good to be aware of this nonetheless. And from there, number two, capital expenditures, financing, and cash budgets. Okay, now strategic versus operational budget. Strategic are more long, longer term in nature, operational or short. Okay. Now, um, okay, budget preparation and approval. Budgets are typically prepared by management and are usually approved uh, by the board of directors. Okay. Now, um, I am going to start using my whiteboard a little bit here. Okay. Um, I want to talk about okay, first our first example, our first numerical example. We're going to be talking about flexible budgets, master budgets, okay, under the assumption that a company is producing a single product. Okay. Now let's uh, let's suppose um, first off, hopefully you guys can all see me. Suppose I have a master budget. And to keep matters simple, let's suppose my master budget unit calls for 10,000 units and a profit of, say, 10,000 US dollars. Okay, then you have actual results come in. Your actual results come in, all right, and you end up selling 8,000 units. And you end up turning a profit of, let's just say, $9,000. Okay, so we have a $1,000 unfavorable variance here, okay? Now, this unfavorable variance is attributable to parts here, what we'll call flexible budget variance, or flex budget for short, and then a sales volume variance, which we'll get into. Now, what I'm trying to explain here is that if you look over here, we sold 2,000 fewer units, and we sold 2,000 fewer units to um, than what we, ex what we expected to sell, okay? So not surprisingly, our profit's a lot lower. And we wanna hone in on the reasons for that. So suppose, it, suppose you're evaluating the manager of a hotel resort and the coronavirus people are no longer traveling. So how would you evaluate a manager fairly using, um, how would you evaluate a manager fairly using a flexible budget? Well, what we would do is we would actually prepare a flexible budget around the 8,000 unit level of activity. In other words, at the budget of 8,000 units at the start of the year instead of 10,000, 
um, what would my actual results, the actual results for this 9,000, what would my profit have been if I budgeted 8,000? That's my flexible budget. And any difference between that and the $1,000 is attributable to sales volume. The fact that you sold, say, 2,000 units less than what you actually had in your budget. Now we'll look at an example. And uh, now we'll look at an example. Hopefully. And I'll be using the board again. So example 1A over here. Okay, now um, all of my examples are in dollars because I'm from Canada. Suppose that ABC produces and sells a single product for $10 per unit. Okay. The company expected to sell 10,000 units in the coming year. Variable costs are $5 per unit, and total fixed costs are estimated to be $20,000. Okay. So this is our budget. It's our master budget that we prepared at the start of the year. Now, if you're not familiar with this form of income statement, this is what we call the contribution format, which is used internally. You would typically not use an income statement format like this for an annual report. Um, okay, but any anything internally, because what this does is this this um, traces variable costs of all kinds, direct all kinds, direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead to sales. A contribution margin basically is your sales less your variable costs. So every additional so you can see here, uh, every unit has a $5 contribution margin. So that means that for a given level of fixed costs, which don't change, um, every additional unit you sell um, will give you $5 more towards your bottom line. Okay, now, so what do I have here? Suppose due to unforeseen circumstances, okay, the sales for the year are expected to, um, are expected to be 8,000 units, okay? Say so we had the coronavirus, an uncontrolled drop in demand, all right? So what happened here, um, if we had to prepare a budget around the 8,000 unit level, what would happen, okay? Um, just recall here that um, you had a budgeted selling price of $10. So if we sold 8,000 units, our flexible budget amount would be $8,000. $5 variable costs, um, that would be 8,000 times five. Contribution margin of 40,000. And again, your fixed costs are the same, regardless of your level of sales. Okay. Now, this flexible budget here becomes more relevant than the master budget, because the thing is, as we, as we go on, okay, The assumption is that we sold 8,000 8, units. And as I explained on the board, okay, as I explained on the board, okay, the difference between the master budget amount is a flexible budget income and the sales volume variance. So we're going to calculate these variances right now. And this is typical of what could be tested. And again, we're only, um, we're only, we're only doing uh, a single product. Okay. Now, so in example 1B here, okay, I'm giving you actual results. And in this instance, okay, our actual results were better than forecast. Okay. So our actual results are just given. Don't try to calculate them, don't try to reconcile them. So we had 11,500 units in in sales and $120,000. So you could see that we negotiated a selling price here of slightly better than $10 a unit, okay? Now, so if we recall, if we actually, I'll just go back here temporarily to our previous master budget, just so you can all get your mornings. If I go back here, um, I, I budgeted 30,000, 10,000 units of sales and 30,000 units at the start of the year. My actual results came here, 
came in at this $28,000. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to view this again. I'm hoping you guys can all see this here. So master budget okay, was $30,000. Okay. And my actuals were $28,000. So I have $2,000 in variances that I need to explain. That's the $2,000 unfavorable variance because my actual results, um, this is units. This is 10,000 units, and this is 11,500 units. So this is the big picture. So your $2,000 here will be the sum of your flex budget variance. And your sales volume. Okay, now what I like to do if I have to face with a situation like this where I have to reconcile, okay, if you know one of these two numbers, I mean the balance of the rest of this 2000 would have to be um, would have to be the difference. I like to hone in on my flexible budget there, which is what we're going to do here. Okay. So I'm going to erase this, I'm going to erase the board here to make give myself a little more room and we're just going to continue here. Okay. This, So um, I'd actually thought of possibly doing this part on the board, but um, I think I won't here. If you can see the screen here, what I have here is a flexible budget at the 11,500 unit level, okay? So basically, if I had budgeted 11,500 units in sales, okay, I'd have a $37,500 profit. So what does that mean? One more time, I've got a master budget income. My actual results. Okay, which is 28,000. Right here. I have a 2,000 unfavorable variance. So let's try to explain that $2,000 variance. The first part of that is the flexible budget variance, which you see on your screen. Okay. Which, which you see on your screen. So your flexible budget variance, okay, would have been thirty. Your flexible budget income rather would have been thirty-seven thousand. Now, if you actually look at this, okay, my actual results were twenty-eight thousand dollars. My flexible budget variance, if you like, will be the difference. So let me go back here to the so just to be clear here, I have a flexible budget variance of nine thousand five hundred. Okay. Of nine thousand five hundred unfavorable. Why unfavorable? Well, this flexible budget variance was built around the same level of sales as your actual results, 11,500 units. So I sold 11,500 units, I made $28,000. Had I budgeted for 11,500 units, my flexible budget says I would have sold, okay, 
9,000, I would have sold 30, I would have made 37,500 profit. So the difference is 9,500. 9, but this is really what you want to come back to. So this is your flexible budget. There it is, 9,500. This you can very easily ask you on the CMA entrance exam, calculate a flexible budget. And this is how you go about it. So logically, even without me doing any calculations, okay, my sales volume variance has to be the difference, 7,500 7, favorable. So 9,500 unfavorable and 7,500 favorable gives you a net variance of 2,000 unfavorable. Now, that's what, um, okay, that, that, that's how you explain the difference between your master budget income and your actual results. First thing you do is you create a flexible budget around your actual level of activity. I thought that would have given me a 37,500 income and correspondingly a 9,500 9, unfavorable variance. And the difference, this would have been my sales volume. Okay, um, that's the sales volume variance itself. Can you calculate that as well? Um, yes, you can. So basically the calculation for this, um, I'm on page 13 here, if you could follow my mouse. If you were to just take your sales volume variance, what I did over here is I plugged for the 7,500, but you can also, your sales volume variance can also be calculated. Well, as, as the term implies, sales volumes, the difference in sales volumes, 11,500 minus 10,000. This being your actual number of units sold minus your 10,000 times your budgeted contribution margin. So this would have given you the 75. Now, why contribution margin? Because suppose that you sell more units and you sell, you sell those units at exactly your budgeted selling price and your variable costs are exactly what you, what you predicted, okay? Any change in profits will be solely attributable to the changes in volume and that will be okay, the difference in contribution margin because what happens? If you sell 1,500 more units, which we did here in budget, that means my sales are going to jump by 1,500 times 10, but my variable costs are always pegged to my sales, so my variable costs will, will also jump accordingly. Okay. Now, um, okay, so just more of the same here um, in example 1C, which again, I'll choose to skip because it's just another example uh, reinforcing what we've already done here, okay? Now, this is an easy enough concept to grasp, okay? Um, now, when we have, okay, when we have multiple products, and this is where I'm leading to next, and arguably the most difficult part of the presentation, or uh, students or candidates will, Definitely find this to be the most challenging part. Before we proceed to calculate numbers here, okay? Um, and again, just be very mindful here what we're looking at. I'm, I'm showing you a template here, okay? Uh, a template that's very, very useful um, to reconcile budgeted versus actual income on the CMA exam. You can be faced with any number of situations. Um, I did look at some past questions on the SEMA exams from the UK. And um, this actually, this type of thing actually appears in different ways. They can give you a standalone question where they, uh, they give you actual or budgeted in income and ask you to reconcile the two figures using the, using the variances, okay? Um, or they can give you a simple standalone uh, multiple choice question asking you to calculate one or two variances. Okay. Now, um, typically the assumption we're gonna make here is that our sales volume 
okay, for each product, it's inevitably going to be different in your actual results. Now, what I'm not, the formulas are here in the boxes. Okay, I'm not going to start recopying them, and I'm not going to start um, walking through the formulas. They're pretty self-explanatory. But what I do want to do, but there are hierarchies here that I do want you to be aware of. Okay. First, you have your selling price variance, which is the difference between, for each product, okay, the difference between the actual and budgeted selling prices times the number of units sold. So try to imagine you have your actual results and your budgeted results. And using a series of sales and cost variances, you're trying to explain the differences between the two. Now, the sales volume variance okay, is very important here because the sales volume variance, first of all, breaks down for each product as the sum of the sales quantity and the sales mix variance. Okay. Now, um, so typically, under the heat of exam pressure, if you're faced with a situation like this, if you know two of the three variances, you can plug for the third. Okay. Um, and if, you, if you needed to do that. Or alternatively, if you calculated all three variants, the sales volume, sales mix, sales quantity, and your sales quantity and your sales mix volume, uh, sales quantity and sales mix variances add up to your sales volume variance, then you're fine. You're virtually certain that you got the correct answers. Okay. Now, sales volume, sales quantity, basically, if we actually look at the formula here, it's the number of all units sold minus the number of budgeted units sold. Okay. Now, you can, sell, you can end up having a favorable sales quantity variance and an unfavorable sales volume variance. When you have multiple products, this is what I'm looking at here. Okay? If you have one product that provides a high margin and another one that provides a low margin, it's still theoretically possible that you sold a lot more units of a low margin product and came out with an unfavorable sales volume variance. Okay because you sold relatively fewer, and that's where your sales mix variance comes in, you sold relatively fewer of your more profitable product. Okay. So now, um, before we proceed to calculating some of, um, some of these variances, okay, I say some because there are approximately 15 to 20 variances, and I don't know that we'll have the time to do all of them, but I will do the more challenging ones with you. And like I said, the um, like I said, the uh, PDF document will be made available to you as well. Okay. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to highlight your attention to is your sales quantity variance as well breaks down as the difference in as the sum of sorry the market share and market size variance. Now, when you have the information to calculate these variances, you calculate them all, okay? But when you reconcile, for example, you're explaining the difference between your actual and your budgeted income, make sure you're not double counting. For example, if between your actual and budgeted income, you put in the sales quantity variance, don't also put in the market share and market size variances because then you'll be, again, double counting and you won't reconcile, okay? So these are your major um, sales variance templates. Okay. Now, everything I wrote at the bottom here, everything that's written here is pretty much what I just, um, what I just explained. Okay. Now cost variances on page 16 of this document, um, we're gonna bypass these temporarily and circle back to them. What I'd like to do now is just to have a comprehensive problem um, in the multiple choice questions at the back, which we are going to um, attempt to start calculating some of these variances. Okay. And um, an attempt to start calculating some of these variances. Now, in case you're wondering what I'm scrolling through, you have your overhead items, material, labor, and so on. We also will have mix and yield variances to, uh, to get to. Okay. Now, so just bear with me one moment here. So 
then the, you have a series of very useful multiple choice questions, um, including one on a, including one having you calculate um, flexible budget variance for the single product. Now, this is what I really wanted to get to. I have a very fairly long comprehensive problem here, okay, where I am actually selling two products and ultimately I'm asking you, okay, I'm asking you to calculate um, a series of variances to reconcile this. Okay. Now, so you have two products, products X and product Y, okay. Now, just one thing to make a mental note of here, okay, which will come in handy here. I'm budgeting 200,000 units in total sales, okay, 150,000 in X and 50,000 Y. So you would like to make a note of it, 75 or 0.75 of your products are product X and 0.25 or 25% are product Y, okay. And again, you can always pause and scroll back when you're replaying the video. So again, please don't worry about that. So um, your net profit before taxes is 17 million. Okay, now, what I gave you on the following page is, and this will come in handy when you actually calculate all these variances. Of course, you're not gonna be memorizing all of these figures. You'll just go back when you're applying the formulas in the template, um, We'll just go back and you'll pull these numbers and you'll apply them, okay? Now, um, and I did the same thing for my actual results on page 24, okay? Now my actual results, my sales mix is a bit different. I have 200,000 units and 40,000 units, okay, of X and Y. And again, more of the same. Now, okay, what I want to do now is get to some of these questions here. Your sales, we're asking for the sales volume variance. Yeah. So we're gonna ask, we're asking for a sales volume variance, okay? Sales price, okay, and then sales price, sales mix, and then sales quantity. Okay, so and then ultimately market share and market size. So let's just start with a handful of variances before we actually, okay, before we actually film. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I'm going to multitask. Okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave the um, problem up on the screen. Okay, so if we were to take, sorry about that, I'm looking at my actual, um, looking at my actual sales, my actual results over here. Now, if I were to actually look, just take product X for instance for my sales price variance. Okay, so you can just look, if you look at product X over here, you can see you have 200,000 units, okay, sold at sales value of 36 million. So from there, you can glean that your actual selling price is $180, okay. So basically, my selling, my sales price variance. Now, if we were to go back to the previous, if you were to go back several pages, you can always view the template again. But this is your actual number of units. We'll do this for X and for Y. Okay. Minus your budgeted number of units. 
your actual units, my, my, my space, times my actual selling price minus my selling, budget of selling. Let's start with product X. Okay, so we sold 200,000 units. From here, my actual selling price, we could see, was would have had to have been $180. Now, if I were to go back to my budgeted amounts, okay. Okay, I would see here that I have, I budgeted 150,000 units at $30 million in total sales. So basically, if you just divide 30 million by 150,000, that would have given you $200. Okay, so I so basically 200,000 times, so basically this will give me, and my actual selling price was lower than my budgeted. So this is for product X, I have a unfavorable, Selling price varies of four million. Okay. Now, I think um, I think it would be redundant for me to do the same thing okay, for product Y. But suffice it to say, you would do the same thing for product Y, add the two together, and that will give you your total selling price here. Okay. Now, let's take a look at uh, slightly more challenging. Um, slightly more challenging variance example. If you have built-in practice here, once you've uh, watched me do one, you can always try and do uh, product Y on your own. Okay, so. Now I just wanna go back a few pages here in your template. Momentarily, okay. So we'll calculate our sales volume variance, okay. Now, just, just a quick warning here, sales volume variance can you calculate for each individual product and you add them up, okay? So what we're gonna do, I think, for a lot of these examples, okay, is we're just gonna calculate some of the variances for product X, okay? And again, as always, you add up, you add up your variances for both products and you get the total variance. So sales volume variance, it's the next one we're gonna be doing. So we already did sales price. Hi, Pierre, uh, Philip here. Just make sure to write, yeah, to write the little um, with bigger fonts. Basically, uh, the letters and numbers are not very visible. So try to make it as big as possible. Okay. I apologize, I apologize everyone else. I'll, I'll, I'll write larger going forward. And try to okay. just write larger. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, now the sales volume variance. Okay, so just to recopy the template here. Okay, so we're going to recopy the template. So it's a number of units sold. Okay, uh, units sold, and, and then basically. Minus those units budgeted. Times your budgeted contribution. So again, if we were to do this for product X, right? Okay, so basically if we're to do this in product X, units sold minus units in the master budget. Okay, it has a budgeted contribution margin for the product. So we will go back once again to our Okay, so for product X, okay, we had from here we can see that we had 150,000 units budgeted to be sold. Okay, from here also we can see that our budgeted contribution margin 
per unit was but our budget contribution margin for product X was 14 million 400. So 14 million 400 divided by 150,000. We'll give you the difference here. So So if we were to go back and look at our actual results. Our actual results again were 200,000. And what we're doing here is we're isolating the effects of sales volume. We're isolating the effects of sales volume um, on our income over here. Now we can tell that this variance is going to be favorable because we've had we had more actual sales of product X than product Y. Okay. So basically, whatever amount we get here okay, will be favorable. Okay. So if we go down to the multiple choice here, I just went right to the solutions in, mul in multiple choice number four here, okay, which is um, later on in your document. So I have product X and product Y here. So the solution is exactly what I said here. Now this obviously over here is 14,400 over 1,500,000 is 96 dollars. So basically here you have 50,000 times 96 dollars. Okay. And that will give you 4.8 million pages. Okay, so we've calculated right now sales price, sales volume variance. Now, um, if you would just like to make sure you can make a note of the total sales volume variance of 4,110,000. Why does that become important? Because again, remember the hierarchy for your sales mix and sales quantity variances. Your sales mix and your sales quantity variances, if you calculate them correctly, okay, if you calculate them correctly, okay, will have to add up to your sales volume variance. Okay. So now um, I'm just gonna erase the board here and keep going. Since I've already got the solutions uh, on screen, I'm just gonna keep working off of those. Um, there's no point in keep. There's no point in going back to the questions repeatedly, okay? Um, because the solutions themselves are answering the questions. And here we go, okay? So that's your sales volume variance, okay? Sales price variance we've already calculated. Now, the sales mix variance, okay? Um, let's just uh, take a quick look at this sales mix variance formula here. Okay. So one thing I am going to do here is just so we can get our moorings is our sales volume variance in total if we include product B. Was 4,110,000. Now, so now I'm going to have sales mix and sales quantity. And again, I'm only going to be doing product. Okay. So for sales mix, for product X, okay. Um, you see the formula there, 0 0.833 minus 0 0.75. So the actual formula for your sales mix variance is your actual sales, sales mix minus your budgeted sales mix times your budgeted contribution margin of all units sold. Okay. Now, so let's just take a look at this. So for product X, your actual sales mix, and I remember the problem by heart, your actual sales mix for product X, you sold 
200, 200 of your units or 200,000 out of 240, that's your 0.8333. You got that from the first line of your actual ABC. Okay. Minus, okay, 150 out of 200, that's your 0.75. So a higher proportion than budgeted, your sales came from your product. So when you did that and you multiplied that by 96 in the previous example, we got our budgeted contribution margin of 96 for this product. Okay, that'll give you 1920. Favorable. Okay. So that's your now again, um, so your sales mix variance here. Okay. If we were to add product X. Okay, our product Y rather. Your sales mix will be five hundred and forty thousand. Now naturally, naturally my sales quantity variance. We'll have to make up the difference. Okay. So we're going down to our sales quantity variance. Now, before we actually um, do that, um, before I actually do the calculation here, let's just make sure, in fact, if on page 32 where the solutions are, your total sales quantity variance is, in fact, 3570. So that adds up to 4,110 when you do, again, when you do these variances for both products, okay? Uh, my personal advice on CMA entrance exam, it might require a little bit of work ahead of time, but I would personally make sure I know and understand the template inside and out, um, muscle memory, I would practice writing it out and drawing it out and knowing what adds up to what, and that way you can just hone in on your answers um, in real time. Okay. So let's just do uh, product X here for your uh, sales, sales quantity varies. Okay, now, you need to follow this template to the letter here. Your sales quantity variance is the sum of all units sold, looking at the formula, minus all units budgeted to be sold, minus the bud times the budgeted contribution margin per unit of product, times the budgeted sales mix for that product. So if we look at product X, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you took all, all units sold, um, basically, so product X, we did 240,000 minus 200,000, okay? Now, this is the number of units sold in total, regardless of time, okay? So times 96 times 0.75, okay? 175, if you recall, 150,000 units of X out of a total of 200,000 were budgeted to be sold. So that would have given you your 2,880 uh, favor. Okay, so thus far, what have we done here? We've looked at our sales price, sales volume, sales mix, sales quantity, and we've reassured ourselves that our sales mix and sales quantity variances add up and tie into our sales volume variances. So, so far, we're nearly done our sales variances. Now, um, market share and market size variances, okay? Um, 
We'll just go back to our templates very quickly here. Our market share, now, we, so what we're doing now is we're going to drill down on our sales quantity variance. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do Next thing we're going to do is we'll take our sales quantity, which if you recall is 3,570,000. Okay. Now that becomes your market share. and the market size. So as in any situation, whenever you have, you know, a single variance that breaks down into two other variances, if you know two of the, th two of the three components, you can logically just plug for the third. Okay. So um, first thing we'll need for both formulas here, okay, we'll need to figure out our weighted average contribution margin. Okay, our weighted average contribution margin per unit, okay, based on, okay, your actual results. Now, let's just go back and trace these numbers here, and we'll go back to our template for a moment. Yeah, so if you recall here, because um, when you do your market share and market size variances, be mindful that these two variances, you only calculate them once in the entire company here. You don't calculate these for each individual product the way you did your sales volume, price, quantity, and mix. This you do um, just in one shot. So basically your weighted average contribution margin, I'm just gonna put that up here. We'll need it for both formulas. So your budgeted weighted average contribution is 17,850 divided by 200,000 units. Okay. So now if we go back, um, there's actually no point in going back to the template. The formula is written out in the solution. So when you did that, you got a weighted average contribution margin of 89.25. Okay, now, okay, so we're gonna need our act. So let's start with our market share, uh, market share variance right now, okay. Um, so if we look at our market share, your actual market share logically would be the actual number of units sold divided by the actual number of units in the, in the market. Now, okay. your actual market share is 240,000 units. Now, this was indicated at the bottom of the, all the additional data. Okay, that we were, we told you, okay, in this problem that the actual market size um, was 960,000. That's 25%. Now we'll do the same thing for our budgeted market share or BMS. Okay. Now our budgeted market share, again, regardless of type, was 200,000 over. 1 million units of, again, 1 million units. So these two amounts were given. So this is gonna be 20%. Now, even before I calculate my amount here, I see I'm gonna have a favorable market share variance because my market share, my actual market share is higher than my budget market share. Okay. So now, 
Um, the name of the variance, in this case, a market share variance, tips you off as to what the difference is, what's changing within the formula. So basically, over here, you're going to have 0.25, recall that was your actual market share, times the actual number of units in the market. Again, that was given. Um, times your weighted average contribution margin of 89.20. Okay. So that'll give you 4284 favorable. Now, um, needless to say, your market size variance will have to make up the difference. Right. Now, um, let's go on to our market size formula. Now, our market size variance formula, rather. So, now here the formula is rather self-explanatory. So it's your actual market size minus your budget market size. This formula is reproduced in your templates earlier as well. So um, at this point, I don't think there's any point in me writing this, writing this one out. Okay. Um, but over here, um, you can see that you have 714,000 um, in favor. Now, again, these two numbers okay, logically should add up to your sales quantity there. Now, I will say at this stage, okay, so um, let's get our moorings here. Uh, we've calculated our sales price variance. We've calculated our sales volume variance, sales mix and sales quantity. Uh, again, one more time, sales quantity, sales mix, add up to your sales volume. And now over here, we took our sales quantity we broke those down into our market share and market size variance is effectively completing our first temp. Okay. Now we're going to start taking a look at some cost variances. Okay. Some cost variances. Okay. Now some of these get to be a little bit a little bit tricky, but um, but we'll get to them and hopefully uh, hopefully you'll come out of this understanding. Again, I can't stress this enough. Um, mm -hmm. Personal, beyond knowing and beyond knowing and understanding all the theory behind this, um, my personal suggestion towards understanding these these variances is start macro, start very big picture. For example, if we take your sales volume variance, just make sure you understand what rolls up into what. Right? In this case, market share, market size, give you sales quantity, et cetera. Start with that. And then, um, and then practice writing down the formulas. Um, okay, I doubt you'd actually have access to a template of any kind on the uh, CMA exam. If you did, then that's great. Otherwise, I, I believe they expect you to know these, um, these persons. So I, I really believe in muscle memory, just practicing writing these out. And, um, and then go from there. Okay, now, so that's um, pretty much what we've done in our sales volume base. But now we're going to start with our cost variances. Okay. Now, um, strictly looking at costs, and in particular, okay, direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, and fixed overhead variances. Okay. And um, so for that, we're going to need another template here. Um, now, you could go back to your notes or you could just choose to follow me, but I will just show you quickly. Um, I will show you quickly that the template is here, um, right? Uh, on when you get the, uh, when you get this document, you'll find it on pages 16 and 17. Okay, so I'm going to do one template at a time here. 
Um, from here onward, I'm just going to go to the actual problem itself. And just get my budget at an actual amount as I need them. So I'm going to stay in this area of the presentation. I'm going to calculate these numbers on the board right now. We're going to start with our direct materials um, template. We're going to erase the board, then we're going to do direct labor, variable overhead, and then we're going to calculate our fixed overhead. Now, one more time, um, direct material, direct labor, and variable overhead. You're going to have, you're going to calculate those variances. What, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you're going to calculate those variances um, once for each product and add the two together to get the total. For your fixed overhead variances, you'll, um, you'll only end up calculating those uh, just once. Now, um, all right, so let's do this. Hi, Pierre, just to make sure you write a little bit larger because we still don't see it very well. Yeah. Oh, I, I apologize. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, Philip, I'll ask you, how's this? Is that okay? Yeah, that's much better. Yeah, much better. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, okay. okay, so I, I'll keep writing this, uh, this level here. So your first template, number one, direct materials. So what I have over here on the far left are my actuals, my actual costs, okay? Which is made up of what? The actual quantity purchase of inputs, okay? Or you can actually, in this case, read these right off of the income statement, okay? Now, over here, actual quantity purchase times standard price. Now, in all of these variances, there's always one number changing and one number staying the same. Here, your price, or in this case, your price per unit of input, like per pound or material, per pound or kilogram of material, for instance, this will be what we call your price variance. I'm just going to complete the template, and then we're just going to do product X, plug some of these numbers in, and then just go from there. Okay. Now, uh, this template in particular right here, I will put actual quantity used. Okay. Now, these may or may not be the same. In this example, they are the same. So technically, I only need to have one number here in the middle of my template. Okay, but I'm giving you this template broken down like this because if the question ever tells you you purchase so many kilograms of materials and use so many kilograms of materials, then you need to break them down because the amounts are different. Okay. Now, um, so let's just, uh, on the far right of all of our templates, okay, and this is important. This is your flex budget amount, meaning it's your standard allowed. or your actual production. Okay, this is very critical and this is an area where candidates go wrong all the time. So example, if I look at product X over here, okay, I believe the product X, I actually sold 200,000 units, right? So on the far right of this template here, I have how much materials was I allowed for the 200,000 units that I actually sold. You don't use your budgeted amounts. Okay. Now, um, okay, I'm gonna erase this template yet again. And now that I've drawn this out, okay, now that I've drawn this out and hopefully explained it, we'll calculate some of these numbers. And in this case, I think what we'll do is we'll calculate them for both products. Okay. 
Okay, so DM for short. And I'm only going to keep one number here in the middle because as I explained, my purchased and used were the same. Okay. On the far left, I have my actuals, my actual material costs. Well, where can I pick those up? I can pick those up from my income statement if I wanted to. All of this is actually formula driven. So if I look at my direct materials costs here, um, if I wanted to do, I can break these down into product X or product Y. Okay, so I do have them for product X. So I think I'll only do them for product X in this case. So that's your 4 million This is gonna be, okay, right off of your income statement. Now, it doesn't matter what you do next. You can go from left to right, or you can go right to the very end, okay? Now, over here, um, this will be your actual, so basically your actual quantity. I'm not even gonna say purchase or use times your standard price. So if I were to go down here, um, I see here um, my actual unit costs. Okay? Um, for each unit, I'm allowed, my actual unit costs ended up being 2.5 times 9.5 times 200,000. That's what would have given you this amount right here, okay? Now, so what I'm gonna do here now, okay, for the middle part of my formula, my actual quantity okay, was basically 200,000 units used, or sold, sorry, times 2.5. Now what I need here is I need my standard price, not my actual price. What you see here given is your actual price per meter of input. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna find that, okay? And that is $10. Okay. All right. So basically over here, I'm gonna give you the breakdown here. This will be 5 million. So I have my first variance right here, my price variance of 250,000 favorable. Why favorable? If you look at what changes here, um, you have actual quantity on both sides, but you have actual price here and standard price here. So if my variance, my number here is lower than this one, that meant my actual price per meter was lower. So I have a favorable price variance. Okay, now on the far right, like I told you, this is your flexible budget enough. How much materials were you allowed for what you actually produce? That's so your actual units, if you like, times your budgeted amount over here, which gives you your flexible budget. Okay, so on the far right over here, I had 200,000 units. Okay, times two. times 10, so that's 4 million. Now one, if you use my templates here, and I hope you do, um, one little trick you can remember here is that the left numbers, when you're looking at a variance, in this case, you have a variance of a million, which will be unfavored. One way you can look at this is if your very, if your number on the left is less than the number on the right, it's favorable. Otherwise, it's unfavorable. And here we have a one, five, we're comparing five million to four million. So you have a one million unfavorable um, variance. Now the explanation behind that, this variance right here is called your quantity or usage variance. If you were to look at the template and the formula on both sides here, you have the same standard price. So this number is higher than this one, which it is, that means the actual quantity I use for my production 
was higher than what I was allowed, so I would be unfavorable. Now, uh, all right, I hope that was helpful. Um, I'm hoping I'm hoping this is more legible um, than what I was doing earlier. Now, the next two templates we're going to look at, direct labor and variable overhead templates, are virtual carbon copies of one another. Okay? They're nearly identical. Okay? The only thing that will change are your actual hours and standard um, and standard hourly rates because what happens in most variance problems that I've seen, most variable overhead is based or estimated based on the same direct labor hours, okay, as, um, as you use for direct labor. I'm not saying that's necessarily the case in practice, um, but it's an expedient, the CMA exams, this is typically what they do. So, Fortunately, your direct labor and variable overhead templates are a little simpler than your shared templates. One more time, the DL for direct labor. Again, we're just doing product. Here, we're just going to take our actuals. And we're going to take these just right off of our income statement. Your actuals break down the actual hours of work times your actual hourly rate. Over here, the same actual hours times the standard rate. And that gives you a rate for spending variance, two words for the same thing. And again, on the far right, okay, it's the direct labor cost that you're allowed for the 200,000 units that you actually produce. So standard hours times standard rate. So basically this is for your 200,000 units, okay? Now, so let's just go back and uh, we're going to need to pull these numbers from our. Income statement. Yeah, if you look at product X, you have 11 million. Okay, now. In terms of actual hours work, I will need this information, so I'll go to the next page. So um, actual hours worked, that's per unit. So I work 2.5 hours per unit. Okay. Now I need my standard rate. So once again, I'll go back and get my standard rate. Which happens to be $20. So if I look at this in the middle here, this amount gives me 10 million. For the reasons I explained earlier, I have a 1 million And a favorable variance right here for my product X. Okay, now this will um, this will be attributed to you paying more for your labor, more your more for your labor than you budget. Okay, now um, so if I actually want to calculate my standard allowed, I have all the information that I need here right in front of me. So basically, over here. I have 200,000 units. Now, what was I allowed for those 200,000 units? I was allowed three hours. At, I was allowed three hours at $20 per hour. That's just given. So this was 12 million. And this will give you and and this will give you a favorable efficiency there. And so you paid more for your labor force, but they were more productive than you expected.
Okay, so that's your direct labor for product X, 1 million unfavorable rate variance, and you also have a 2 million favorable efficiency variance, okay? Uh, or productivity variance, as they might call it. Okay, now, um, our variable overhead okay, template will look very, very similar, okay? In fact, there's really nothing much else that needs to be explained. But um, one thing I will do, once I erase the board over here, okay, uh, hopefully I'd like to try, if possible, to have your variable overhead and fixed overhead templates together um, on the board because it's something I'd like to explain. Uh, I'll try to make it as large as possible. Once again, always doing just product X. Once again, uh, just to be clear here, okay? Products for direct materials, direct labor, and variable overhead, you need to calculate the variances for each product, whatever variance we just did here. So you essentially need to do everything twice and add up everything to get the total, okay? Um, now, unfortunately, when we want to test sales mix, sales quantity, and sales volume variances, um, typically, we need to give you more than one product. So, yeah. so your variable overhead and you have your fixed overhead. We're going to do one template at a time. Okay. Now, um, if we go to our variable overhead for product, product X, once again, I'm not going to write out the template the formula because it, they're virtually identical to uh, what you have for direct labor. So 4,500,000. Uh, it's 4.5 million. Now your actual hours, okay, times your standard rate for your Your, so your standard rate and your, first off, let's get our actual hours again. So you have variable overhead, you have your actual hours are 2.5 hours per unit. Times your standard rate. Which, okay, so basically, which is six dollars. Okay, so we have our variable overhead right here. We have our actual hours of 2.5, that's 200,000. That's, so that'll give us three million. Now, what else do we have here? On the far right, it's our standard allowed for however many units we produce. Well, we have our budgeted information right here in front of us. Okay, so we produce 200,000 units. Okay, 
And for each unit, we were allowed two hours at six dollars. All right, so that's two million four hundred thousand. So this will give you an efficiency variance of six hundred thousand. Unfavorable. Again, meaning you used okay, more hours than you were allowed. Right. Now, um, for your fixed overhead, your fixed overhead template is much more quick because you don't have to do this for you don't have to do this for uh, each individual product. Okay, so what we're going to need here are actual and fixed overhead. Our actual fixed overhead amounts. Okay. So our manufacturing fixed overhead, okay, was six hundred and six hundred thousand budget. Now, if you were to go and look at, if you were to go take a look at your actual manufacturing, off your, act, act, off your actual results, it's 570,000. You have a budget or spending variance here. Of thirty thousand. Okay, we're almost there. We're almost. We're almost. Um, almost nearing the end of our calculations here. I'm not going to say near the end of our presentation because there are some things I want to tie up here. But the reason I put the reason I put down the reason I put down these variances together on the on the board at once is to actually just show you something. They ask you to calculate a flexible budget overhead variance without specifically saying fixed or variable. Okay. If you look at your total overhead cost, okay. If you look at your total overhead cost, you have 4.5 million variable, 600. Uh, well, you have to add in product Y, but assuming product X is your only product, the sum of your actual variable and fixed overhead, that's your actual overhead. Now, what were you allowed? Remember, a flex budget is whatever you were allowed for what you actually produced. Okay. What would you have been allowed? You would have been allowed this 570. Your fixed overhead, your budgeted fixed overhead is fixed no matter how much you produce. That's all you're allowed. Plus whatever you have on the far right of your template. Okay. So if I wanted to calculate, um, here I will erase the board. Okay. Um, so if we were to just You can do something like this. Budget, budget, you're allowed. But for fixed, you had um, actual was 570. Budget, it was 600. You had 30,000 unfavorable. Now for your variable overhead, you would do the same thing. Your actuals, basic. I'll just put an X here because basically this would be the sum of product X and Y over here. Okay. And basically this would have been the standard allowed. Okay. 
when would you end up doing something like this? Why am I even showing this to you? In case they ever ask you, well, flexible budget, or another word for that's also called the controllable overhead variance, which is basically what I'm doing here. The difference between your budgeting and your fixed overhead. Okay. Now, um, okay, now, so your variable overhead, your actuals would have been given to you on the income statement, and the right side of your template over here. The difference between the two is favorable or unfavorable. Now, there's one final variance that I want to calculate here. It relates to your fixed overhead. Okay. If we go back and redraw our fixed overhead, if we go back and redraw our fixed overhead template. Again, we already did this, but you have your actuals. Your budget, so this is going to be unfavorable. Now, what we have over here, we can calculate what we call a denominator or production volume variance. which will tell us, even though we don't use this figure to reconcile our actual budget income, this will tell us how efficiently we used our fixed overhead. Um, sorry, this is, uh, this is correct. Um, you know, I believe I made a mistake, correct? Yeah, okay, so that's my actual budgeted. So if I were to look at my budgeted fixed overhead for a second, okay. if you stop and just think to yourself, okay, go back to your budget. In my budget, regardless of type, I budgeted 200,000 units. Right? Remember 150,000 of X? And so that's $3 of fixed overhead that I'm allowed. For you. Okay. Now, if you stop and look at this, if you look at your actual results, which are actually right there on the screen if you wanted to see them, I actually got 240,000 units of production instead of 200. So this is like an efficiency variance that you saw for variable overhead. It's called denominator of production. So I would take that same amount here. 40 times three, that's 720,000. And I can calculate a favorable denominator, also called production volume variant. Okay. Now, um, again, you would not use this to reconcile. Okay, so with respect to this problem and one more tiny little variance that I wanted to um, go through with you as we near the end of the presentation and tie up some loose ends. What I provided you here with, okay, I also have this all done on Excel over here. And I just wanted to pour out this superficial with you all. Okay? Um, you'll recognize some of these numbers. Okay, So basically, even though it wasn't really required to answer all of the questions, near the end of the document, I provided a reconciliation of all of my variants. And I'll just remember, um, 
just just remember that um, we only did this for one uh, for one product typically. Okay, but these these are basically the sum of the different types of products. Okay, so we have our budgeted income, we have our sales volume, which we calculated in no particular order. Direct material, direct labor. Um, you see, I have two variances under each underlying category. Well, that was my template. You had the rate and efficiency, and you would have multiplied them both. Um, you would have added, added the two together and get. And yeah, here's your budgeted fixed overhead spending variance that we just saw. That's your $30,000. Okay. Now, we also had, um, we also had an other category that you would have seen on the income statement. There was nothing for you to do there. So literally just take the other variable and other fixed on your budgeted income statement and on your actual income statement and just take the difference and then you would have reconciled perfectly. This actual income was the income shown on the actual income statement and your budgeted income would have been right here as well. Um, so that's that's largely it. I hope I hope that was helpful, okay? Now, but what's very important here to, to take away, okay, is you notice that I have a sales volume, but remember I calculated all those other variances as well. Well, sales mix and sales quantity, and they're not here because the thing is, your sales volume variance equals your sales mix and sales quantity. So you can either just put your sales mix and sales quantity or your sales volume, uh, just one or the other, not both. Okay, otherwise, you won't reconcile. And again, um, your market share, market size, add up to your sales quantity, which makes up your, um, which makes a part of your sales volume variance. Okay. Now, um, now that we've done most of our, pretty much all of our heavy calculations for today, um, they can ask you, okay, some, some theory as to when you would investigate a variance. Okay. Basically, a company can create its, its own internal benchmarks for performance, okay, based on last year's uh, results, okay. And there could be a subjective element to that as well, but I think the most likely questions you're going to see on your CMA Part 1 exam, okay, on your CMA Part 1 exam would be um, calculation, of, calculation of some of these variances. Now, um, I hope that was helpful. There is one other thing I wanted to um, talk about, even though we won't necessarily calculate it. I think it's unlikely to be tested, but what can theor theoretically be tested, okay, are mix and yield variances, okay? Now, um, this allow me to find these momentarily on the uh, presentation. Okay, well, um, it's here. I'm not, I apologize. So, sorry. Okay. So I don't think I'll need the uh, document going forward anymore. This is just something else for you all to be aware of. Okay. And you have a couple of walkthrough examples in the document. When you have quantity variance for material, this can also work for labor. When you have more than one input, let's just say you have two materials that make up a product, M1, M2. One material is more expensive than the other. Okay? One material is more expensive than the other. 
And you can have this quantity variance here can break down as you mix and your yield variance. A mixed variance will tell you, well, if you use, if you per, if you produce a certain amount of units, did you use for your total inputs used, okay? Did you actually use proportionately more or less of the expensive materials to produce the same units? If you used more of the expensive materials, you would have had an unfavorable mix variance. Now that could be worsened or improved by a yield variance. Maybe for those materials, you got more more production out of those out of those materials than you actually budgeted. Um, the reason I'm choosing not to spend any time uh, walking through an example is because, you know, as you can see, there are, there are enough variances on your plates here um, as it is. And um, here in Canada, we used to have a CMA designation. We no longer do. And from what I recall back in the day, from what I can see on the CMA exams, okay, quantity variance, sales volume, sales mix, everything we, we ended up doing today thus far is um, much more likely to be tested than mix and yield. But I would urge you to just um, walk through the example anyway. And once again, as in any, um, as in any variance situation, uh, if you have your total quantity variance, say your total quantity variance was 100 favorable. If you know your mix variance was 120 favorable, Logically, you can plug and get your yield because your mix and yield add up to your quantity variance. All right, everyone. I think um, I think that's all for this presentation. Um, I hope you uh, hope you found this helpful, um, and I uh, uh, hope you're going to walk away with something that'll help you for your CMA Part One exam. Um, I'll uh, I'll open the floor now to some questions, and I'll try to take as uh, I'll try to take as many of them as I possibly can. All right. So um, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pierre. Uh, thank really, you. Yeah, really great presentation and uh, very good insights uh, into the topics that um, the CMA Part One is is actually testing in terms of flexible budgets and variances. Uh, right now, we're going to move uh, briefly to the questions. I um, encourage all participants to. Of course, post their question in the in the questions uh, part of the dashboard, um, so we can, of course, you can answer um, as many as possible. Uh, during the presentation, we already received a few questions, so um, yeah, you can check um, the question um, section, and um, I'll be reading off uh, directly from it. Um, so basically, we have a question from Sulaiman Al Sulti, and his question is based on what the organization can use ZBB or incremental budgets in this economic crisis, and what type of budgets are you recommending to use specifically for oil and gas industries? So you can check this question up here just to make sure we are on the same page in the question part um, where you can expand. Okay, well, I, I will start out by saying I have no experience in the oil and, and, and gas industry. Um, but I mean, since nobody's driving today, um, at least not here, uh, and given given the total dive in, in, in oil prices right now, I would... I, I would personally think uh, zero-based budgeting would um, would be the way to go. I mean, you're trying to minim, you're trying to cut down, you're trying to cut down uh, your cost. But even then, um, how much how much will that help? I mean, when the drop in sales, when the, when the drop in the price of oil just hurts your revenue so much, any savings you recoup by the zero-based budgeting. Um, if you manage to recoup a lot through zero-based budgeting, um, 
that could indicate, if you start using zero-based budgeting and you manage to cut down a lot of your costs, to me, that might indicate perhaps your, um, your operations were you know, not as efficient as they could have been. Um, is there another question? Uh, yes, there is. Um, uh, it says, uh, Zakaria Al-Azizi. Normally, yeah. we prepare budget in advance a year. Is there a better strategy? Is there a better strategy? Um, again, that's a loaded question because it depends on so many variables, internal, um, external. When I, I worked at Nestle a few years back, and the thing is that um, budgeting always took up close to an entire quarter. And um, streamlining streamlining the budget for us, what happens when you have, when you, when you create a budget? Um, you're working basically with projections into the future. There's a lot of unknowns. You're also dealing with the internal politics of budgets and, and all of that. My personal take is if you can streamline the budget process, that's great. But I, what I think is more important than that, okay, is basically BA being able to come up with real time, close to real time, um, accurate forecast because I mean this time last year I don't think anybody factored in the coronavirus and and its impact that it would have had on society and supply chains and everything like that and granted some factors might be outside of your control but once you've budgeted uh, once once you've budgeted something I think that it's really it's really beneficial if you can come up with revised and ideally accurate forecasts um, as quickly as possible uh, based on all the information is there. And once you have that forecasted information, I mean, it helps if your channels of communication internally are open and there isn't a lot of red tape and then you can act on that information quickly. So, um, and a lot of companies employ dashboard software for this, which, which helps. Um, the only other thing I'll say here is, um, the human side, uh, the budgeting, performance evaluation. A basic principle in managerial accounting in general is that you don't penalize managers for factors outside of their control, okay? Um, for example, if you're running, um, for example, let's just say you're, let's just say you're at the head of an airline. Uh, you're, 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 you're a very profitable discount airline. You're, you're keeping your costs. Um, you're, you're, you're keeping your costs low, um, your jets are flying full all the time, and all of a sudden, you're hit with this coronavirus. I mean, that's just really, really destroyed the industry altogether, in addition to your own company. Um, that's where a tool like a flexible budget would come in, or um, would come in handy, um, just from a human standpoint as well, because domino effect would be morale, adverse morale, adverse adverse productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea behind variances okay, is not to, not to lay blame. It's just to highlight areas. And like in any other area, the quicker you get that information, the quicker you can act on it. Um, so be it. And sometimes unfavorable variances themselves might not necessarily be all that meaningful. For example, if there was a mistake, which could happen calculating your standards, maybe your actual results are in line with what they should be um, or are, are in line with uh, those of those of the industry. Maybe internally your company is doing everything right, but somehow the standards don't really reflect reality or are not necessarily realistic. That can be that can be another another issue as well. Okay, um, hopefully that was helpful. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'll gladly take them. Yep, yep, a few more actually, because we're um, actually um, uh, running out of time. Basically, we have um, covered the limit for, for this webinar already. Anyway, we'll try to answer a few more questions and then we'll sum up. Uh, so we have a question from Brian Christopher Pineda. What would be... Hi, Brian. Yeah, what would be the advantage of ZBB versus incremental budgeting? Uh, 
Okay, well, zero-based budgeting, you're actually you're actually justifying you know, you're justifying expenses as though they you take a hard line with every single expenditure. This means that the employee's got to justify every expenditure as though it's occurring for the first time. Well, incremental incremental budgeting. Um, From what I understand about incre in incremental budgeting is every new expenditure has to get approved based on um, based on its merits, based on its benefits. Um, for in incremental incremental budgeting, I just think um, I think zero-based budgeting might be a little bit rigid, but I think the problem with incremental incremental budgeting might be that you're just maybe bending the rules a little bit too much when it comes to a lot of these additional expenditures. And um, I think that I think that the harder the harder the times are, the harder the harder a time a company is going through. Um, zero based zero based budgeting is, is a lot more stringent, I feel like. And I think that's one of the main advantages in you know, employees get the message that they can't necessarily slide through expenses as they might be able to do under an incremental budgeting scenario. Okay, next question. Yep, um, we have a question from Mohammed Al Dabah. Um, which budgeting method is best for cost reduction, zero based or activity based? In most instances, I would say zero-based for sure. Um, activity activity-based costing. Okay? You're taking your costs, you're breaking them down into these activity-based cost pools. Now, how many cost pools do you use? Um, if anybody knows anyone who's done activity-based costing, it can be a very, very costly endeavor, and you're trying to just trace back the cost of activities. Um, it just okay that can help you actually allocate total overhead and basically see where your resources are being being used up but zero based budgeting is sort of i think a more readily accessible solution to most companies because not every company will necessarily and even then activity based costing is costly to implement and then how many cost pools do you end up using? Do you, it's activity-based costing in theory is meant to give you more product costs, uh, more accurate product costs. But if you're dealing in an, with an environment where all of your costs are fixed, um, all of your overhead costs are fixed, I don't know how much, and the thing is there's nothing that really can be done about them in the shorter term. Uh, I'm not sure that an activity-based costing uh, system is really worth its cost, but that's just my opinion. Um, Zero-based budgeting, I would think, is a lot, a lot more easy to implement. Um, so I would, I would see what that does to your bottom line first before going down the ABC cost route. Okay. okay next question. Yep. Uh, we have a uh, we have a question from Mohammed Ali. Um, Hi, Pierre. Excellent presentation and quite self-explanatory. My question Thank is. You. Uh, my question is, while considering the costing part for the preparing budget, is it better advice to take standard cost for materials or moving average cost? Um, generally, most man large manufacturing companies will just generally use standard cost. I mean, if you're in a manufacturing environment, um, Generally, you are, you'll probably be using standard costs. And one thing I did forget to mention during this presentation was um, one thing I forgot to mention was that the assumption we were making, because there are different types of costing systems, and I could have gone into those if we had more time, but the assumption we made throughout my long variance presentation was that we were using a standard costing system. Um, moving average is basically um, okay, there are merits there are merits to doing that but one of the um, it's a lot easier I think to calculate variances when you're doing when you're doing a standard costing system and 
the other thing, the other benefit to using a standard costing system is because what happens is um, certain times of the year, some businesses that are seasonal, okay, uh, your co the cost of your major inputs might fluctuate throughout the year. So you get these huge spikes in inventory and ultimately these huge, these huge spikes in your profits because as your inventories go up, then your, um, as your inventories go up, then your, your equity goes up, your income goes up, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you buy large quantities a few times a year and all of a sudden you have these huge spikes in inventory, um, that can cause huge fluctuations to your income. So um, using, st using a standard costing system um, is one way to mitigate that. Okay, next question. Hello? I'm sorry, but wh whoever's talking, uh, somebody yeah. was talking. Before. Yeah. Can you can you hear me now, Pierre? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I can hear you, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was I was muted. Uh, basically, we have a question from Ali Al Lawati. And it says, can you name some internal controls which can detect or minimize over budgeting by managers more than what they actually need? Uh, in, in, internal, internal, um, okay. Well, I can think of a few. Um, for example, basically, um, well, again, this is where, where standards come in. Um, for example, if you start top down, if we're talking about production, okay, managers might be inclined to increase their production. You increase your inventories, okay, you increase your bottom line, and that can mean you look better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it comes down to the board and the higher levels of management just sort of keeping an eye out on the lower levels without necessarily over-managing or micromanaging, um, taking a zero-based approach again. Okay, so for example, justifying total production amounts. Okay, so why do we need, why do we need so much production? Okay, can you substantiate the sales? Do we need this much inventory, et cetera, et cetera? Um, now, in some lines of business, like where I used to work, I here in Canada many years ago, I used to work for Nestle's ice cream division, and the business model there was that it made no sense to produce ice cream or to produce a batch of ice cream in a different in a given size and flavor uh, without without producing these huge these huge production runs. So sometimes to develop economies of scale. Okay, understanding your business, every business is different. Sometimes you need to actually spend a lot of money and you need to deal with the cost of storage and possibly the cost of spoilage and so on and so on, um, you know, to make, to make your costs um, viable. But I would, I would just say basically um, possibly have for, for dollar amounts in excess of a certain amount or production amounts in excess of a certain amount, um, I'd say require multiple levels of approval or uh, several levels of the order. Now, I, that's not necessarily expedient. Typically managers have spending authority up to so much, but anything beyond that, maybe lower the spending limits and have those scrutinized a little more um, or have the system raise a red flag when uh, have a system raise have a system raise um, have a system raise a flag when production or purchasing exceeds predetermined amounts. Um, I'd imagine most of you are dealing with companies that are being audited, and um, one thing I at least here in Canada, auditors aren't allowed to do within their mandate, I believe. Okay, is they're allowed to. Um, um, allowed to recommend basically and provide a special report on the status of your internal controls. Now, um, you can have an operational audit as well as an audit of your financial statements. Basically, um, I think it might pay to get to, to, to get an internal, to get to, to get an external opinion, basically as a result of your financial statement audit 
or an operational audit um, to just detect um, because you know you're you're in one level of the organization you might not necessarily have complete visibility as to what's going on elsewhere yep okay next question this is the last question because we actually have a lot of questions but we can't go through all of them um, so this is the last one uh, what do you think of rebase lining practices this is by Rashid al Zuhair. Rebased lining, um, I'm not able to answer that because I, I've never heard of it. Maybe I know it under another term. I can I can inquire, but I, I can't help you there because I've I, I've never heard I've never heard of rebased lining. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, that sums it up. I'll just to put my screen on as well. Um, I would like to, first of all, thank you uh, for the wonderful presentation. Oh, really? Yeah, and for the great insights. Thank you so much. Um, um, I would like to, of course, let the participants know, um, of, uh, of course, of this webinar that the recorded session uh, will be available within a few days, once we, of course, have it ready for uh, distribution and um, I would like to thank all for uh, of course joining us this afternoon and uh, being attentive of, of this uh, webinar uh, with your presence thank you so much um, we'll be also um, distributing the actual uh, certificates on your emails um, electronically you should receive them today if not tomorrow uh, so by completing this uh, webinar, you will be, of course, receiving um, a certificate of attendance. Um, again, I would like to mention that the CMA Part 1 session is scheduled to end of June. Um, we have Mr. Pierre Hilal as our lead expert trainer uh, conducting the six days session on CMA Part 1. So for um, all of those that are pursuing the CMA designation or would like to know more about um, the Certified Management Accountant um, designation, you can contact me directly and I'll be glad, I'll be more than glad to share with you all the relevant details. Uh, thank you so much from my side and um, if there's anything else Pierre would like to conclude, we'll be of course uh, logging out and ending this great webinar. Pierre? Well, thank you, everyone, and hope to see you all uh, soon. Thank you so much.